Right. Well, welcome. Um, I can see this is the, the, the waiting room is, is emptying and people are coming in. Great to see you or not see you, but great that you are here. Um, I'm Gordela Weiss Sussex. I'm one of the um, uh, two directors of the Center for Study of Contemporary Women's Writing. And um, I'd, yeah, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, event um, and to this new seminar series, So Hot, Feeling the Heat in Contemporary Women's Writing. But mainly what I want to say is thank you to the conveners, uh, to Alexandra Pugh and Ellie Walters, because they've done a fantastic job, I think, in uh, thinking about the topic, thinking the topic through, making sure it works as a seminar series, getting all the speakers. Um, and I think they've put together a, a really great program. Um, so this is really, the seminar series is really a continuing a tradition we've kind of built up over the last two or three years, um, where we ask or we, we give a platform to uh, young uh, uh, colleagues, to either postgraduates or ECRs, uh, to devise their own topics and run their own, um, run their own series. Uh, I'm really grateful to Ali and Ellie for picking this up and doing it. Uh, if there's anyone else out there who'd like to do it, just get in touch. But now I'm just looking forward to today's session and um, I hand over to Ali and Ellie. Hi, thank you so much, um, Gordela, for that introduction. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. It's really exciting um, to see so many people here today. Um, so yeah, firstly, just some thank yous. Thanks to Gordela and to Shirley Jordan, who can't be here today, um, for your support um, as Ellie and I conceived of and organised this seminar series. We'd also like to thank Jenny and Kathy at the ILCS, um, who've been incredibly helpful and supportive in making this seminar series happen. Um, so yeah, a very warm welcome uh, to the launch event in our seminar series entitled So Hot, Feeling the Heat in Contemporary Women's Writing. Uh, and in addition, happy International Women's Day <laughs> um, to all who celebrate. It's definitely appropriate that the launch of our seminar series should fall today. Um, so just to give you a very quick introduction to the series, as you know by now, um, Ellie and I have put together a programme of seminars that centre on the theme of heat. Heat, as we see it, is just one possible lens for connecting body, affect, power and planet. In her work, What's the Use?, Sarah Ahmed writes that she's concerned with following words. To follow a word, she explains, is to ask not only how it acquires the status of a concept in philosophy, but how that word is exercised, rather like a muscle in everyday life. Thinking about the use of words is to ask about where they go, how they acquire associations, and in what or whom they are found. So um, in devising this series, we've been following the word heat. Um, and this brought us firstly to consider its affective and sensory dimensions. Heat is something that we feel on our skin and beneath it as our bodies face illness and change from fevers and flushes to burning pain and blushing cheeks. There's a whole lexicon of sex and intimacy that relies on images of heat, the old flame, the hot date, the hot girl summer. Heat is also bound up with both ecological and economic injustice. We're currently faced with the climate, energy and cost of living crises in which we inhabit the paradox of cold, unheated homes in an ever warming global climate. Heat then is unevenly distributed within society and across the planet. Following the word heat also brought us to Elena Ferrante, who in an interview in the Paris Review stated, Whenever I get to the real start of the story, I tend toward an expansive sentence that has a cold surface and visible underneath it, a magma of unbearable heat. So with this metaphor for writing in mind, this seminar series will explore how heat figures in literature written by women from across a range of lang languages and cultures. The speakers in our series will cover such topics as hormones and aging, pleasure and intimacy, protest and rage, and the global climate emergency. United by a conceptual focus on heat, this seminar series will move between the cellular and the planetary and the personal and the collective. So um, I'll now hand over to Ellie just to introduce today's launch event. 
Thank you, Ali. Um, so on this day in early spring, where across the UK snow is falling, we had all together to launch the So Hot seminar series. We begin with a seminar on bodily, heat, bodily experiences of heat, specifically how heat figures as affect, effect, sensation and symbol in contemporary works of poetry and prose. Our esteemed speakers, Veronica Shipter, Felicity Moffat and Sam Brooke Kaufman, will share their research into corporeal and co cultural knowledges of heat from temperature fluctuations caused by hormonal changes, such as during the menopause and medical transition, to what it really means to be cool. Before we begin, Ali and I wanted to give a quick run through of some texts and contexts in which hot bodies surface in recent women's writing. There's perhaps nowhere better to start than Elaine Scarry's The Body in Pain, which draws on the thermal dimensions of our thinking and feeling certain kinds of pain. Scarry lists hot pain, burning pain, scalding pain, searing pain. The white hot searing pain of cramps and aches are sometimes somehow soothed by added doses of heat, hot compresses, hot water bottles, even just hot water, as in Abby Palmer's sanatorium, an experimental memoir of her participation in a thermal water-based rehabilitation program to treat her chronic pain. Heat inside and outside the body can reconfigure even redefine corporeal boundaries. Perspiration as a means of cooling provides one example of how the body is not hermetic, but rather porous and leaky, like the protagonist of Mary Darius X Pigtails, who smells richly of sweat, warm crotch, living flesh. In the thick, oppressive summer climes of Ferrante's days of abandonment, Heat, heat stroke, and overheating reduces the body. The protagonist notes, I was wasting away, desiccated. I was as dry as an empty shell on a summer beach. Heat also penetrates and skews consciousness, moving us into dehydrated, altered states. Verente's protagonist describes the hours of the hot day accumulating under her skin, pushing her into a so-called mania, brought on by the foggy breezes and oppressive humidity from the hills, the river, the pavement. We might equally think about hot to touch irritations, itchy insect bites and inflamed prickling rashes, as in Samantha Schweblin's Fever Dream, a novella in which protagonists are poisoned with contaminated rainwater, which reacts with the skin, stinging, boiling, before sinking further into the flesh and causing fever, heating one protagonist up to an unbearable temperature, her fingers swelling up under her nails. The unbearability of heat appears in Lauren Groff's Matrix, in which a sudden rush of blood to the surface during a hot flush leaves the protagonist's body electric with heat, her skin with a roiling fire stuffed into it. The outbreak of COVID-19 sparked new interest for readers and writers alike in plagues and pandemics. We returned to the staples of the theme, Susan Sontag's illness as metaphor, Virginia Woolf's on being ill. Work written and published so far in response to febrile foreheads, congested sinuses, and the stuffy claustrophobia of quarantine includes Sarah Hall's Burnt Coat, Ali Smith's Summer, Patricia Lockwood's diary essay, Insane After Coronavirus, and Matty Diop's short film, In My Room. Similarly, isolating in Paris, Paul B. Preciado wrote in May 2020 of body temperature checks on national borders, exploring how the clammy skin of feverish bodies maps onto the politics of space. The virus, he writes, actually reproduces, materializes, widens and intensifies the dominant forms of biopolitical and necropolitical management that were already operating over sexual, racial and migrant minorities. In this sense, he goes on, the new frontier is your epidermis. Some housekeeping or some garden keeping to use a less gendered term. Please do keep your microphones off whilst our speakers are presenting, but do feel free to keep your cameras on if you want. The papers are going to be recorded, but the Q&A won't be so that we can have a more free and open discussion. We invite you to drop questions throughout the session in the chat box, which will be picked up and read out at the end. Um, or do feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask a question during the Q&A. We'll have a short comfort break about halfway through the seminar. So I'm now going to hand over to Siobhan McIlvany, Professor of French and Francophone Women's Writing at King's College London, who has kindly agreed to chair our panel today. Siobhan will, in, will introduce our speakers in turn and later moderate the Q&A session. Over, over to you, Siobhan. Thank you very much, Ali and Ellie, for inviting me to occupy the hot seat, I thought I couldn't resist that, in this launch seminar of the series on So Hot. As you have heard, the lineup of speakers for the series is fantastic, and this launch series is no different. Also, as um, Ellie has clarified, each speaker will speak for approximately 25 minutes in turn. We'll have a short comfort break after the second paper, and then we'll proceed to the final paper, which will be Psalms, after which there'll be a Q&A. Also, as Ellie said, please feel free to put questions in the chat as the, the kind of seminar evolves or save them until the end. 
And equally, we're really happy to take um, sort of virtual face-to-face -face questions, um, particularly because as has also been clarified, the recording will only be for the presentations. There will be no recording during the Q&A. So I would love now to move on to the first paper, which is by Veronika Schuchter. And Veronica is currently a visiting fellow at the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing at the Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies at the University of London. She's previously taught and researched at the University of Oxford and Nottingham Trent University. And her current research examines a substantial corpus of menopause writing by writers published in the 21st century. It highlights diverse menopause experiences to help us understand how menopausal women trans and non-binary people see themselves, what the menopause feels like to them, how they imagine a world in which their bodies are visible and validated. Veronica is particularly interested in the intersection of medical humanities, feminist and queer theory, gender studies and contemporary women's writing. She's had articles published in Peer English, Text Matters, Contemporary Women's Writing and Studies in Canadian Literature. And the title of her presentation today is Sometimes Within a Flash, I Feel As If My Femininity Is Coming Apart. What flashes and heated gender debates in recent menopause memoirs. Over to you, Veronica. Muted. Um, thank you so much for this very kind introduction. And before I share my screen, I just wanted to um, echo all the praise for Ellie and Ali. Um, this is a truly exciting and I think really invigorating and new way um, of looking at contemporary women's writing. So many congratulations to you and thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Is this working and can you hear me okay? Okay, great. For today's paper, I'm going to be talking about three recent menopause memoirs. The Middle Pause, Life After Youth by Marina Benjamin, Flash Count Diary by Darcy Steinke and Kimiko Does Cancer by Kimiko Dobimatsu and illustrated by Keith Genise. I use different aspects of these texts to illustrate how stories of the menopause can illuminate issues of gender, the politics of aging, as well as it, what, what it means to build community across generational lines. I preface my literary analysis with a small excursion in which I begin to assemble a transgenerational feminist practice of relations. Most commonly, Western feminist movements have conceptually been arranged along generational lines, relying on the analogy of different waves that focus on the needs and demands of women at specific points in time. Those waves allegedly evolve as new generations of feminists formulate their own demands and build in on the achievements of their elders, while also rejecting some of the ideals of those who have come before them. As such as with other ideologies, feminism's evolutionary potential is often portrayed to be rooted in generational conflict. Anglo-American feminism especially has tended to equate generations with difference and has put forward a narrative of linear progression. So each succession of a generational wave heralds progressive change. In the last two decades, resistance to this model has grown and scholars such as Iris van der Town, Claire Hemmings, Victoria Brown and Alex Martinez Rowe have argued for more nuanced approaches to feminist movements at different points in time. By tracing this feminist genealogy, I show that oftentimes marginalized positioning of aging discourses in feminist academia may stem to some extent from a unilateral engagement with aging and older feminists. Accordingly, it is productive to consider the menopause as a cultural and embodied phenomenon that spans generation and presents a transition towards being considered socially older for those experiencing it. To think through these limiting generational barriers, I proposed a concept of menopause futurity, which at its core is multidirectional, transgenerational, and a feminist relational practice that allows caring for those who have come before us, while also embracing one's own futures and those of the next generation. I come to this concept via Anne Newman's claim that the future is menopausal and Martinez Rowe's work on transgenerational feminism and feminist genealogies. 
My own interest in this has grown out of some mild irritation. I'm constrained by time today, but perhaps there will be space in the Q&A to lay out in more detail a curious tendency of foundational texts on aging by famous white feminists and philosophers that only seem to have become interested in aging as they themselves were considered old or older, which is similarly reflected in scholarly work on feminism and aging that keenly decries a lack of allyship from young feminists while conveniently stay, staying silent on the support, respect or compassion the authors themselves have and continue to show their elders. I want to begin by acknowledging my responsibilities as a feminist researcher who is not yet menopausal, but engages with people's menopause testimonies. There is immense generosity in sharing this deeply personal, vulnerable and stigmatized experience and receiving it requires, requires care and accountability. This reflection also requires connecting responsibly with this, in my case, deferred identity within a feminist framework. As I develop my concept of menopause futurity as a transgenerational feminist praxis and navigate 21st century, century textual representations of the menopause, I'm currently only sure of one thing. This process, mu process must be collective, dialogical and transgenerational in nature. So I welcome comments and conversations. By centering feminist collective practice, Martinez Rowe's work rejects the conventional wave model on the grounds that, quote, linear models of time belong to ways of understanding the world that don't account for complex entanglements, and they ultimately serve to hide the agency of what has come before in shaping what is to come. Martinez Rowe identifies that what is to come as, quote, the features imagined by earlier generations actually brought about through the actions of later generations as they respond to what has come before then. The affirmative relational mode of a transgenerational feminist practice that Martinez Rowe proposes has the concept of acknowledgement at its core. This entails situating yourself in relation to those who came before but also affirming, continuing, and doing the politics of difference they invented, not doing and being the same as them. The relational mode of acknowledgement can be one way to exit discourses that equate young with narratives of progress and old with narratives of loss. Instead of only arguing from a unilateral perspective through which younger feminists can only look ahead to their future selves and older feminists can only look back to seek support, I propose shifting the conversations to how we can move toward a model of transgenerational, multi-directional allyship in which an anticipation of aging as well as the memory of youth brings with it acts of solidarity. In my reading of Flash Count Diary, The Middle Pause and Kimiko Does Cancer, I follow this genealogy of a practice of relations that is central to Martinez Rowe's work in To Become Two, and which she understands as working on relationships as political practice where relationship starts from and values each other's difference. This is a generative approach for me as I analyze these memoirs as a cis woman who has not yet experienced menopause and also a generative mode of reading the primary sources as being in relation to one another. Okay. The Middle Pause, published in 2016 by Marina Benjamin, focuses on the author's hysterectomy and surgical menopause at the age of 49. It's one word chapter titles, organs, hormones, skin, muscle, heart, guts, teeth, head, spine, are indicative of the emphasis on the corporeal realities of aging. It is a rich dissection of how Benjamin experiences her body and her life in her 50s. And while there's a lot more to say, I would like to focus on two aspects today in which this memoir, in my opinion, deviates from the more normative menopause memoir path. And there is... Firstly, it highlights the importance of intergenerational and intragenerational exchange, and it also dissects the neoliberal female aging narrative. A common trope in menopause narratives is the reduction of younger women, frequently in the form of daughters or other close female relatives, as unwelcome reminders of an idealized past self. 
Benjamin still does this to a certain extent when she perceives herself to be mirrored in the opposite by her teenage daughter. However, the memoir is also a rare example of an engagement with aging and menopause that is explicitly mentions a cross-generational aim. Benjamin frames her narrative with a transgenerational trajectory which embodies the practice of relations and presents one example of how a menopause futurity may operate. By mentioning ever so briefly on the first pages that quote, my body is my starting point for storytelling, for inducting younger women into the business of getting older. The author sets her memoir up in a way that subtly shifts the focus from an purely intragenerational concern, so writing for those who share the same experience, to one that is more transgenerational in its outlook and moves away from a unilateral positioning of the middle-aged and menopausal woman who is condemned to only look back with disdain to what she no longer is. Towards the end of the memoir, Benjamin acknowledges the limits of the top-down generational model by advocating for more intragenerational solidarity. She writes, what I'm attempting to describe here is a horizontal sharing of knowledge and experience that cuts in a different direction to the mother to daughter transmission of women's secrets that we are more familiar with. Happily, it is egalitarian. There isn't one party who knows more than the other or, or who has greater retrospective purchase on things. It also has something in common with clan think, but where the family clan can be prescriptive and doctrinaire, my cohort of equals is as fluid as a Mexican wave. The model the author sketches here does exit the assumption that expertise, experience and support are always top down rather than horizontal as she phrases it. To me, taking it one step further and moving away from horizontal to multidirectional would hold a truly revolutionary potential, much more so than any candid discussion of aging ever could if it only serves one demographic. It would also break the generational cycle of silence and Benjamin also describes how her mother never talked to her about her own menopause. Don't get me wrong, I believe the creation of community amongst those with shared experiences is very important, but I also believe that discussion of, men, of aging and menopause requires the invitation and participation of differently aged people in order to remove its stigma. I have a confession to make. When I first started reading this memoir a couple of years ago, I was struck and irritated in equal measures by its exceptionally bleak and graphic description of the author's experience of turning 50. So much so that I stopped reading after the prologue. I did not want to read about how, quote, aging was going to punch me in the face like a thug or that soon I'll be policing my features for signs of decay. No, thank you. I was frustrated with my own frustration, especially because I felt that I was coming short of my own feminist moral and ethical expectations, especially the transgenerational element of it, by dismissing a woman's testimony because she did not model the future I was hoping to see for myself. It is hard sometimes, nigh impossible, to leave your human self at the door while your scholarly self gets on with the job. I think it's important to share moments when we miss the feminist standards we set ourselves and do our best to try again. I said contemplating my desire for consuming tales of aging women, girl bossing their way through menopause and coming out the other end refreshed and with a new sense of self. And so I picked up the book again and I'm so glad I did because already in the first chapter, Benjamin addresses the structural issues that might have also affected my own initial reading of her book. The author describes how books on aging have often engaged with a misguided sense of empowerment. She says, yet it strikes me that the positive thinking and self-actualization movement of the past few decades has had such enormous influence on our self-understanding that plenty of writers who ought to know better have succumbed regardless to its easy certainties, its unwillingness to face up to pain, doubt, guilt, fear or regret and its damnable good cheer. Admittedly, in the context of positive thinking and esteem boosting, the shabby business of aging with its drooping shoulders and drab clothing must have stood out as being in dire need of a makeover. But I marvel at how common it has become to mistake morale lifting for genuine empowerment. This for me also shifted my understanding of what Benjamin was trying to do, her conscious, consciously brutalized description of her own aging body and of 
put some um, of those on this slide, transcend the singular perspective and become one way to counteract the hegemonic morale boosting. Though I think it's also important, it's also important because sometimes morale just needs to be boosted. Um, but quite early on, the author also addresses both the limits and possibilities of the memoir and her own singular perspective. She acknowledges, what follows is a personal testimony. It won't resonate with everyone. I very much hope that women who are not like me, women who are single, widowed, black, childless, lesbian, disabled, will find plenty, plenty of common ground in what I'm able to offer. Darcy Steinke in Flesh Count Diary is less forthcoming about her own positionality and arguably pursues a different kind of community. The memoir takes its name from the diary Steinke used to keep to track her hot flashes and is a mix of memoir paired with musings and observations from literature, history and philosophy that frequently interrupt or even disrupt, at least to me, the personal testimony. The kind of community she envisions is, to borrow Benedict Anderson's term, an imagined or perhaps assumed community of other cis white women in straight relationships. The memoir features frequent references to a homogenous group of, quote, many women, some women, few women, and they all say, feel, do um, certain things. And the memoir also contains many generalizations that are not backed up, such as when she states self-evidently that, quote, outside of sex, men are never keen on hearing how our bodies feel, but both the onset of fertility, sexuality, and birth are of interest to them in a way that menopause is not. Many women feel during menopause that an old self is dying. Nobody wants to hear about menopause, even menopausal women themselves. This is especially curious since the book was published in 2019 and because the memoir subtitle is a new story about the menopause. Whenever the memoir leaves its more formulaic path of statements, references to articles and literary works and offers the reader insights into the author's affective experience of the menopause, it comes closest to its promise of a new story. In a chapter entitled Demigirl in Cameron, in which Darcy Steinke lays out how aging and menopause have had a profound effect on her understanding of gender and gender presentation. She describes her own menopause experience as a process she herself terms ungendering. She writes, without hormones, my femininity is fraying. Twice I've been called sir. I tried to sit with the idea that I've been misgendered. I don't possess the strong female signifiers I once did. Defeminization is not on the list of menopausal symptoms. Even if ungendering were listed, it would be framed as negative rather than as the rare opportunity it is to finally slip outside the brutal binary system. In menopause, femininity strains, splits at the seams, and what once seemed natural now has to be constructed. I feel less like a woman, or at the very least, less the woman I was. During menopause, I slip out from under a claustrophobic femininity, but I also don't feel fully masculine. I feel in the middle, a third gender. The author never goes so far as to say that she identifies as non-binary, but it is in passages like the one I just read out that the memoir is at its most radical. It is also in this chapter that Steinke cautiously leaves the familiar, familiar compounds of the straight white cis narrative and expresses an explicit desire for community and how I read it, queer kinship with other people. And this is the first time she uses the more neutral signifier who are also experiencing an ungendering in the hopes to find connections with those, quote, who are disoriented, but also electrified by their new hormonal configurations. What I find particularly intriguing about these passages that are tucked away in between miscellaneous quotations is that menopause is conceptualized not just as the old self dying, um, like she mentioned at the beginning, but as a radical opportunity to dismantle and reassemble the gender, old gendered self. This also maps onto the concept of menopause futurity in the sense that looking at this and time of hormonal change and social transition is not exclusively a subtraction, a negative, a loss, but it also renders visible the possibility of a newly gendered or differently gendered self. 
And the final memoir also grapples with the possibilities and limitations of gender at the intersection of menopause and illness. Kimiko Das Cancer is an autobiographical graphic memoir that tells the story of Kimiko Tobimatsu, who is diagnosed with a rare form of breast cancer at the age of 25. Because of the cancer treatment, she must undergo lifelong hormonal treatment that results in surgical menopause. This kind of menopause is often overlooked in general discourse, which tends to focus on a majority of menopause experiences revolving around cis women during late middle age. This memoir, however, demands a reconceptualization of the menopause, not as a structural part of aging, but a necessary biomedical intervention on a young person's body. How can we conceptualize the menopause if it's not something that exclusively happens to cis women of a certain age? Kimiko does cancer explore, explores some of those key questions. When the protagonist is first diagnosed with breast cancer in her early 20s, she feels betrayed by her body because it was, quote, unnerving to think about how long the lump had been there growing inside of me. She soon discovers that her cancer is hormone sensitive and that she will require daily medication to keep her menopausal to prevent the cancer from recurring. Kimiko struggle navigating the healthcare system, her cancer and her menopause as a mixed race queer woman becomes most visible through a desire and failure to see community in several instances. Feelings of isolation and unrelatability are common tropes in textual representations of the menopause, which in turn can function as communities by proxy by representing a breadth of different experiences. Kimiko does cancer, for example, carefully illustrates the additional difficulties queer and gender non-conforming people are confronted with when accessing healthcare. After the cancer diagnosis, Kimiko faces physicians' rigid expectations around gender and femininity when discussing reconstructive breast surgery. The, perspective, um, the prospect of losing her breasts is one of the rare instances of her cancer diagnosis in which the protagonist feels something akin to cautious excitement. And she thinks to herself, losing my breasts wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I wonder if I'd like to look, I could play with gender a bit more. However, as the narrative progresses, it becomes evident that there is little space in the medical system for gender non-conforming people such as the protagonist. In a series of five panels, the memoir depicts the exchange with the plastic surgeon who displays a cheerful smile throughout while observing the unevenness of Kimiko's breasts, the surgeon suggests self-evidently to plump up not just one but both breasts while she's there, without consulting the protagonist's opinion or asking after a desired gender presentation. Kimiko does not seem particularly phased by this interaction since, as quote, a queer woman, she went into the whole experience with some distrust towards doctors, particularly around sexual and physical health. Throughout, the protagonist feels let down in a quest to see communities who share her experiences of cancer and menopause. As a mixed race woman, she feels that, quote, the mainstream cancer narrative was so white, feminized and apolitical, the peppiness seemed to gloss over the way cancer affected people differently based on race and class. To illustrate Kimiko's discomfort, the reader encounters several panels of three white women with light hair or scarves draped around the heads in exaggerated superhero poses shouting, we're survivors, fighters, warrior, we kick cancer's butt and look good while doing it and we live in the moment. Along similar lines, as a person in her 20s, the protagonist also feel, feels let down by the solidarity formed around experiences of the menopause. In a panel titled Menopause Women Try to Relate, the reader watches Kimiko in front of a Christmas tree in an apron with a stern facial expression, her arms crossed, listening to three middle-aged women who cheerfully declare, hot flashes, been there, done that, honey. Even though her face is out of frame in the subsequent images as she cooks a meal, her increasing annoyance at the women's perceived misplaced solidarity is paired with a physical act of chopping, pounding and stabbing of the food she's preparing, accompanied by a verbalization of her irritation. It's frustrating that they think they know how I feel. I know they're trying to be empathetic, still it's annoying. Maybe they deserve an explanation for why it bothers me, but why should I have to? 
When Kimiko approaches premenopausal friends for support, she is similarly confronted with them not being able to fully understand, illustrating that in Kimiko's case, both the intragenerational as well as the shared experience model fail and ask for differently constituted um, ways of relations. These three texts offer a glimpse into a future that is indeed menopausal. The menopause, be it naturally or induced, changes a body's familiar hormonal makeup, and with it brings a shift in identity for many menopausal people. Be it coming to terms with a new body, the sudden perceived loss of male desirability, the potential exiting of rigid gender norms or identifying as a newly disabled person. In the literary analysis, I showed that um, the text revealed the feminist menopause potentiality along several axes and across generational lines. Moreover, I read the act of publishing and making oneself potentially vulnerable as a generous act of feminist solidarity through which menopausal people build community for others. I suggest that the menopause, both as a tangible health issue as well as a conceptual building block, is a useful tool to work towards mo modes of transgenerational feminist alliance. As briefly I outlined, the generational and ages divides within feminism can often be attributed to a unilateral position of young and old feminists, in which the former is said to be dismissing the latter, who in turn is seemingly unable to look ahead anymore. Thinking with menopause futurity allows for multi-directional modes of care and acknowledgement across generations, a relational practice in which acknowledging, including, and caring for those who have come before us is also embracing our own futures and the ones of those who will come after us. There is room for ambiguity and instead of a hardened binary, young versus old, it moves toward a transgenerational practice of relations in which the anticipation of old age and the memory of youth leads to acts of feminist solidarity. I just have my work cited. And thank you very much um, for listening. Thank you very much, Veronica. That was um, really, really fantastic, really thought provoking. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I think you really brought out well the need for both a kind of more collective, inclusive consideration of the menopause at the same time as kind of highlighting the really diverse individual experiences it encapsulates. So um, I'm sure I know I've got lots of questions, but I'm sure there'll be lots of questions being lined up for, for that paper. So thank you again. So we now move on to the second paper, which is a paper by Felicity Moffat. Felicity is currently a PhD student at King's College London, where she's supervised by, by me, by, by Professor Siobhan McIlvany and Dr. Rose Murray. Um, her PhD is funded by the London Arts and Humanities Partnership and it explores representations of midlife women in French language fiction and film. Her thesis is cross-disciplinary in approach, fitting not only within the context of French and Francophone studies, but also within women's studies, cultural studies of age, and cognitive studies. She's an MST in comparative literature and critical translation from the University of Oxford, a BA in French and Spanish from King's College London, and a BA in law from the University of Cambridge. And the title of Felicity's paper is um, Turning Up the Heat on Stereotypes of the Midlife Woman, Not Just Hot Flushes and Hopelessness. Thank you, Felicity. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Siobhan, for that introduction. And obviously, many thanks to Ellie and Ali for organising this. Um, let me just see if I can get my tech to work. Okay, is that good? Fine. So, uh, as Siobhan said, my research is looking at representations of middle-aged women in 21st century French language literature and film. Uh, this research is in its early stages. It's still very much work in progress, and I would welcome any comments or suggestions you have. So there's a relatively small but growing number of texts in French which have middle-aged women as their main protagonists. And it's these texts which I'm seeking to identify and interrogate to see what they have to say about 21st century female midlife in the French speaking world. Do they reflect the pessimistic perspective of Simone de Beauvoir from the last century when she wrote in Le Deuxième Sex about the middle-aged woman losing her femininity, sexual attractiveness and fertility at midlife? Do they coincide with Beauvoir's view 
that at midlife a woman loses la justification de son existence et ses chances de bonheur? Or do these texts provide a welcomed increase in visibility to midlife women? Are their narratives actually optimistic or even progressive? So let me start with a confession. This paper is not discussing a text where heat is a central theme, but I will be interrogating my chosen text by metaphorically turning up the heat on the way it represents its main protagonist and what it has to say about fem female midlife more generally. The research for this paper is framed in particular by gerontologist Margaret Morgan Roth Gullett's binary notions of narratives of de decline and progress. Gullett maintains that we're aged by culture. By this, she means that our ideas of aging are molded by cultural influences. In other words, our ideas about aging women are influenced, for example, by characters and stories told from childhood, such as the Wicked Queen in Snow White, and by the value placed on youthful femininity, reinforced by, for instance, uh, cosmetics adverts, TV, film, and social media. Furthermore, for Gullet, the menopause acts as what she calls a magic marker, culturally signaling the start of a period of decline for women. And she calls for a greater emphasis on narratives of progress to help counter ageism and middle ageism. Nevertheless, the narrative of decline has persisted. And today I would like to explore a French text, which is representative of a number of the other works that I'm studying. Its framing of aging presents a paradox. Although it raises the literary profile of the older woman through its use of a female midlife protagonist, its narrative is undercut by an un unhelpful thematics, one that can be read as supporting firstly, culturally pervasive ideals of feminine beauty. Secondly, the stereotypical construct of the undesirable middle-aged woman. And thirdly, the female midlife is the start of a period of inevitable decline. As I hope to show, Chloé Delorme's Le Coeur Synthétique, published in 2020, displays an evolution in attitudes beyond Beauvoir's negative view of the female midlife. And yet, this evolution is not reflected in an unequivocal narrative of progress. I'll look first at how the text uses stereotypes of female midlife, focusing particularly on how it approaches issues of perceived attractiveness and embodied ageing, as emphasised through the trope of the mirror. I'll then discuss the interaction between these notions of embodied aging and desirability with the text's humour, irony and intertextuality. I'll finally talk about how the text's ambiguous nature is reliant on Readly agency to decode its meaning and how it risks supporting a more limited and conservative interpretation of middle-aged woman, thereby reinforcing rather than counteracting the narrative of decline. So Adelaide, the protagonist in Le Coeur Synthétique, is a newly divorced, childless 46-year-old woman looking for love. Moving into her tiny flat in Paris, she contemplates singledom optimistically. The anonymous, ungendered narrator tells us with a touch of irony that Adelaide se veut sur les livres, désormais affranchie du carcan conjugal. Yet it is made clear early in the story that her high expectations for rediscovering love will not be met. Adelaide est sûre que très bientôt quelqu'un va venir à sa rencontre. Adelaide at all. As we are to discover, it's been seven years since Adelaide was last single. She's unaware of how her age will impact her desirability, creating a mismatch between cultural paradigms of aging and her expectations and sense of self. Her arrival back on the dating scene forces her to confront her aging appearance and her relatively disadvantaged position when compared to her younger self. The omniscient narrative voice contributes to the portrayal of this middle-aged woman's apparent naivety as she encounters a state of singlehood that she has not anticipated. C'est l'histoire d'une fleur bleue qu'on trompe dans de l'acide. Adelaide Bertel, c'est une femme comme une autre. The refrain of C'est l'histoire de recurs throughout the narrative and attaches to the femme comme une autre, marking a progression as Adelaide increasingly realizes that her romantic dreams are unattainable. The repetition of une femme comme une autre in the various iterations, meanwhile, reinforces this idea of the universality of her experience. The looking glass and the associated reflected image of self are recurrent motifs in Le Clos Synthétique. The mirror acts as a reminder to the protagonist of her aging appearance. Her reflected image is a source of her literal and metaphorical disempowerment. In an echo of the earlier passage, the narrator comments, c'est l'histoire d'une peur bleue qui se regarde dans le miroir. Adelaide Bertel, c'est une faille comme une autre. Vulnerability and fear are thus linked to the middle-aged woman's confrontation with her physical appearance. The reference to faille 
reminds the reader of the midlife protagonist's failure in love. Her thigh or floor is her undesirability, whilst it also suggests a fissure or division, reiterating the idea that the image in the mirror is other, far removed from her imagined self. The so-called truth of what Adelaide sees in the mirror points to an internalized prejudice based on cultural norms of beauty. The thigh recalls the Lacanian idea of an incompleteness or lack in the female body, which in this case extends to the menopausal body. Lack here disempowers the woman and her undesirability further distances her from, a se from sexualized status. The use of the looking glass by Adelaide contrasts with some modern revisions of fairy tales, which have used the trope of the mirror as a vehicle to reflect women's desires and fantasies. These modern tales have moved the mirror away from its historical role in subjugating women through culturally imposed ideas of beauty. But Adelaide's use of the mirror does not help her to determine her own story or establish her own subject position. Instead, her apparent reliance on the mirror in judging her own appearance reflects its more traditional role. It foregrounds her passivity and negates her agency by limiting her self-assessment to parameters arguably beyond her control. Adelaide's response to her image is perhaps inevitably complicit with societal expectations of age-defying female appearance, given what Delong describes as her épuisité you. This is a difficult concept to translate, but roughly equates to an intense need to be married. In other words, Adelaide's desperate need to be married drives her desire to be desirable, placing particular importance on her appearance. Adelaide's use of the looking glass fits within Jenny Joy LaBelle's theories on how for a woman, the mirror is an important tool, not just for, for beholding her face and form or for seeing how the world views her as a physical object, but also for analyzing and even creating the self in its self-representations to itself. According to LaBelle, Whenever women look at their reflection in the mirror, they see not only the reflection at that moment, but also a comparison of what they've seen before and what they hope to see in the future. This idea of a continually evolving sense of self informed by societal expectations of appearance seems to coincide with what's depicted in Le Coeur Saint-Étique. LeBel's theory does not necessarily imply a negative perspective, but in this text, it seems that Adelaide is always destined to be disappointed. The looking glass thus acts as part of the machinery of society, creating a judgmental circularity. Adelaide's mirror image becomes a reflection of her reflective judgment of others' judgments of her. The narrative voice emphasizes her collusion with the mirror and her foolishness in placing such value on this external judgment. And yet, the text simultaneously validates her assumptions, for example, in her failure to attract the men she desires, which affirms the connection between appearance and desirability. For Delong, the mirror therefore performs a dual role. It underlines Adelaide's negative perspective of her aging appearance and the sense it provides her of not only herself, but also how others see her, while simultaneously drawing attention to the mirror's patriarchal positionality and the fact that the mirror only speaks a partial truth, by which I mean the viewer only sees what they're capable of seeing. Whilst I don't agree with Basia Slavinska's assertion that the reflective side of the mirror belongs to men, uh, which seems to me to be a little simplistic, I do believe that looking in the mirror is nevertheless a gendered process, a process which is heavily influenced by cultural constructs and expectations, and which becomes increasingly problematic as the female viewer ages, and her anticipated reflection diverges from what she sees in the looking glass. This is a dynamic which is evident in the text. So as Adelaide seeks to delay the effects of time, addressing her thinning hair and aging skin, and buying expensive serums, the reader is reminded of the pseudo-medicalized commercial interventions criticized by Naomi Wolf in The Beauty Myth. Indeed, it appears that these costly interventions are futile for Adelaide, as the ironic narrative voice highlights her embodied aging in a parody of Snow White or Sleeping Beauty. Adelaide s'endort, et sa décrépitude s'étale sur l'oreiller. The use of the word décrépitude suggests a speeding up of time as Adelaide appears to age rapidly beyond the midlife, seemingly confirming her own fears of aging. Le Coeur saint constructs midlife female desire within a range of signifying practices which underline male privilege and control. Adelaide's desire is founded on being desired by her male counterparts. The text accordingly creates a tension between on the one hand, feminist and post-feminist mes messaging about autonomy, personal preferences and desires, and on the other, a complicity with the patriarchal voice. 
If the older woman is deemed less desirable to men based on, the, on societal constructs of beauty, which privilege younger women, and the female protagonist's desire is derived from that male desire, then the fulfillment of her desire is clearly less achievable as she ages. Adelaide's experience in looking for love contrasts with her ex-husbands, who found another partner a fortnight after they separated. Which brings me to the other male characters in Le Cœur Synthétique, none of whom are archetypal handsome heroes. Her boyfriend, Martin, initially provides Adelaide with male company and limited sexual satisfaction, yet she increasingly feels that she's compromising her standards by being with this man who she whom she compares to Jabba the Hutt, an allusion to the Star Wars character known for his obesity and greed. If Martin is less than ideal, the other men that Adelaide targets as potential love interests are either gay, married, or uninterested. Even Grégoire, the lover introduced as a possible companion for her at the end of the book, is rendered hypothetical by the narrator's mediation. Nous l'appellerons Grégoire, c'est un joli prénom pas encore employé. He also has significant physical shortcomings with bulging eyes and a huge nose. Emphasis is therefore placed on the discrepancy between genders regarding perceived desirability at midlife. Women are apparently required to maintain a youthful femininity for as long as possible, with no equivalent requirement for men. Whilst this discrepancy between men and women's appearance and desirability may also apply to younger men and women, here it appears exacerbated as women age. The typical romance narrative and its assumptions of unconditional love and desire appears to have undergone little revision. The text fails to truly question Adelaide's quest for Mr. Wright as a worthwhile goal. In fact, the romance narrative merely emphasizes the older woman's vulnerability and emotional insecurity. As her desire to become the object of the male desirous gaze increasingly defines her, it foregrounds her passivity as she waits to be seduced. Adelaide is also aware of her growing invisibility. Initially, it's the narrator who points out that il va de soi que personne n'a prêté attention à une quadragénaire. But Adelaide herself soon becomes aware of this invisibility and even benefits from it. Elle sait que personne ne la voit, ne la regarde, elle en profite. Elle se sent comme un fantôme. Invisibility is portrayed as both beneficial and detrimental, a theme that recurs in some of my other texts. This might, of course, reflect the contradictions inherent in aging. Most women would surely agree that unwanted attention is a negative aspect of youthful appearance, and that, in this sense, a growing invisibility is to be embraced. However, the same cannot be said of invisibility associated with midlife when looking for love. The text introduces a further negative aspect to invisibility, namely its association with death. Adelaide compares herself to Bruce Willis, Willis's character in The Sixth Sense, a 1999 American film in which Willis plays the role of a child psychologist treating a young boy who says he can see and talk to the dead. In the denouement, Willis's character discovers that he's dead himself and cannot be seen by the living. And this idea of a living death is intensified in Le Coeur Synthétique, which like a literary vanitas has multiple words and phrases associated with death. Adelaide is compared to Vion d'Avarier or labeled Périmé. The imagery of rotting food connects the midlife woman not only with death, but also with undesirability and revulsion. In Powers of Horror, Julia Kristeva describes decay as a privileged place of mingling, of the contamination of life by death, of begetting and of ending. The aging female body in Luco Santatique is thus moved beyond the impurity of corporeal waste into embodied objection. Furthermore, the very notion of comparing a woman with food further reinforces her status as an object of desire to be consumed. Yet in this case, the midlife woman is beyond consumption, existing in a kind of existential degenerative limbo. Decline is further emphasized by the gradual dissipation of the optimism which Adelaide displays at the start of the novel. The seasons track her state of mind, supporting the association of the female midlife figure with death and decline linked to the onset of a physiological winter. Adelaide starts to show a pessimism about her future. She says to her friend Judith, Je vais crever toute seule. Indeed, the very narrative structure of Le Coeur Synthétique supports this idea of midlife as a precursor to death. The text focuses almost exclusively on Adelaide's midlife crisis, followed by two brief alternative versions of the remainder of her life. These versions suggest choice, but each version is problematic in that it does not fulfill Adelaide's dreams. The first possibility is the unlikely Grégoire and the staid unromantic marriage, the second is a series of brief disappointing love affairs, 
a growing focus on her career and a reliance on her cat and her few close friends for company. Either way, at 76, Adelaide is once again single and forms an artistic collective with her closest friends. This supportive sorority ensures that she does not die alone. But when Adelaide does die, she leaves no trace. The text incorporates little nostalgia or memories from her younger life. And so the midlife is seen as the start of the end rather than a continuation of what came before. Lucas Saint-Étique therefore seems to posit a pessimistic view of midlife and its endogenous disappointments. However, all may not be what it appears. In an interview in 2020, Delorme references Helen Fielding's Bridget Jones's diary as part of her inspiration for Lucas Saint-Étique. And this opens the way to an alternative reading. Just like Fielding, Delorme writes a parody of a typical romance or female Bildungsroman, shifting the focus ironically away from a younger heroine to a middle-aged woman. Adelaide has internalized the romantic paradigms from traditional fairy tales, and in particular, the sense of fulfillment derived from finding Mr. Wright. It is only over the course of the novel that Adelaide comes to the gradual realization that this may not be the outcome of her search for love. The novel is thus what Barbara Frey Waxman describes as a rifling roman with an emphasis on maturity rather than self-cultivation. Adelaide's mature coming of age is reflected in her realization that these romantic paradigms are mere fantasies. What is perhaps surprising is that a woman of her age and education has not been aware of the impact of gendered aging earlier in her life. And yet, whilst a more cynical protagonist might appear more real realistic, it is Adelaide's incongruous naivety which creates much of the humor which forms the basis of the narrative. Delorme's paratextual acknowledgement of the influence of Fielding's Bridget Jones's diary creates a literary genealogy, given that Fielding's text is itself a parody of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, which in turn plays off constructions of gender in classical fairy tales. Adelaide might therefore be perceived as an amalgam of various archetypes, a mature Bridget Jones in her belief in the power of love and her unremitting search for Mr. Wright, Elizabeth Bennet in her non-compliance with the traits of the typical romantic heroine, and Snow White's wicked stepmother in her jealousy and seemingly narcissistic focus on her own appearance. Further intertextuality is added by the first and last chapter headings, Une Chambre à Soi and Les Guerrières. These reference two iconic feminist texts. Firstly, Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, with its message of autonomy as the foundation for female achievement and its call for women to be seen other than through the eyes of men. And secondly, Monique Wittig's Les Guerrières, with its depiction of rebellious sorority and departure from female fixation on sexuality. The intertextuality that these two headings introduce in bookending Le Coeur saint Etique fits the themes of the chapters, but also forms an epitext, extending the boundaries of the novel beyond the text itself and setting it within a context of historical feminism. This intertextual multiplicity thus extends beyond the core narrative, creating a palimpsest of meaning which demands the interaction of the reader informing their own interpretation of Adelaide's story. Humor contributes to textual indeterminacy and raises some obvious problems in this case. Firstly, whether the reader will find female aging a subject suitable to be laughed at at all. Secondly, whether the reader actually finds the patronizing narrative tone amusing. And thirdly, the distinct possibility that even if the reader is happy to laugh at the subject matter and finds the narrative tone amusing, that humor attaches frivolity to Adelaide's response to aging and thus comes at the expense of the aging woman. Any such frivolity creates a tension between feminism, sexism, and ageism. If we're laughing at the midlife woman, where does it leave any feminist interpretation? Do we lose the benefits of normalizing the midlife female experience if the text makes the experience laughable? Yet humor alleviates what might otherwise be a rather depressing account of this liminal moment of midlife crisis. It allows the author to confront what might otherwise be a taboo subject. It helps to deflect embarrassment, shame, or fear associated with the female experience of aging through the familiar trope of the comedic singleton replayed here with a mature protagonist. Meanwhile, the ironic narrative voice provides a subtle, perhaps overly subtle, critical commentary on attitudes towards aging women. There is therefore a tension between humor as a facilitator, making the text more enjoyable to read, and its potential to undermine the middle-aged woman and to trivialize her experience. In conclusion, Le Coeur Synthétique is an ambiguous text. 
a feminist and or age anti ageist read reading would point to the intentional defamiliarization of a mature protagonist search for love. It would highlight the contradiction between the protagonist's proclaimed status as feminist and her perceived incompleteness without a committed male partner. It would emphasize the inequity of female aging and would view the text's humor as a softening of the didactic feminist message. The text would be a platform for the attuned reader to question and challenge the stereotypes and assumptions attached to the female experience at midlife. Read in this way, the ungendered narrative voice appears to be modeled more on an Austin-esque style of narrator as social commentator who invites the reader to form their own judgment. On the other hand, read without a feminist or anti-ageist lens, the text articulates notions of female midlife as chaotic, hysterical, and isolating, with a lack of a man portrayed as deficiency, thereby potentially fueling gender and age prejudice. Although it appears inconceivable that Delorme, a self-declared feminist, has written Le Coeur Synthétique to pander to a patriarchal reader, its ambiguous nature nevertheless permits such a reading. It risks reinforcing rather than challenging the female midlife narrative of decline. It risks causing the narrative to lose its corrective function, its intertextuality to be overlooked, and its feminist cues to be misread. So whilst my paper has not discussed a text which has heat as a central theme, it has, I hope, shown how important it is to turn the heat up on these sorts of narratives, to interrogate what they say about the female midlife, to see where they're sit situated on the narrative spectrum between progress and decline. The key question I have regarding Le Coeur saint is therefore the following. Should we condemn it for failing to provide a clear narrative of progress and affirmative aging? Or should we nevertheless celebrate it for raising the literary profile of the older woman? Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicity. That was very rich and I think you, it emphasised the kind of ongoing constraining role of the specular, I think, in um, women's self-image, despite their perhaps initial espousal of more liberating optimistic discourses. Although you did, there was a hopeful note at the end with the, the intertextual and the, the collective. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, we're now going to have, I'm just going to look, shall we say my clocks is, uh, 5.33, so should we perhaps reconvene at 5.40? Would that be enough just to, fantastic, just to have a comfort break? Um, so if you just want to mute and put your cameras off and then we'll, we'll open up again, so to speak, at 5.40. See you soon. Hi and welcome back everybody. It brings me great pleasure to introduce our third speaker in this launch seminar. Sam Brooke Korfman from the University of Pittsburgh is the author of two books of poetry, including most recently My Daily Actions or the Meteorites, one of the New York Times best poetry books of 2020 and a finalist for the Publishing Triangles Trans and Gender Variant Literature Award. Sam's scholarship on the constitutive relationship between art practices and gender transition has appeared in TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, QED, a journal in GLBTQ Worldmaking, and College Composition and Communication. And the title of Sam's paper today is Another Word for Cool, on two poems by Jameson Fitzpatrick. Sam. Hi, um, I'm going to share my screen. So let's see. Dun, dun. Um, can we all see that? Great. Um, and let me know if at some point you can't hear me. Um, so yes, the, uh, the title of my talk is another word for cool. Um, thank you, Ellie and Ali and Siobhan. Um, this has been great so far. Um, on this first slide, there's just a QR code and a link for an access copy. There's not too much text. It's mostly images and um, then the text of the poems I'm going to be talking about. Um, but so if that would be helpful to you, follow the link. I'll leave it up for just a second while I start and then um, and then we'll kind of move on. Um, so 
In my talk, I'm going to build on some of the work I began um, in the piece published in Transgender Studies Quarterly in 2020, which now feels like a really long time ago. Um, uh, that was called Melting Muscles, Casillas Terasius at the Intersection of Affect and Gendered Embodiment, though um, the subtitle could also have been something like heat as a method of affect transmission, or what does non-medical body modification mean anyway? Um, and from there, I'm going to follow some of the implications of that work about feeling heat, a la the seminar's theme, um, as both a physical and an emotional sensation in the work of a few poems by a trans woman writer, Jamie Fitzpatrick. Um, it says two poems, but since we had a couple more time, I'm going to like quickly dive into a third, actually, also, unless I take too long while I'm talking. So we'll see. It'll be a bit of a mystery for everybody. Um, I also wanted to say I, you know, in, in dealing with these specific poems, I didn't quite get out to climate change, but I do think that there's something, so maybe after or in the Q&A we could talk about, in my, in this paper sort of investigation of how heat and feelings and bodily sensations match up, there is, I think, maybe something interesting in the way that climate change rearranges our associations with heat or a metaphorical sense of like what the seasons do or what heating up does. And the, so that's something we might think about a little bit more. Um, before I start, I do want to just say really quickly, uh, kind of a note about the political climate around gender transition in the US and in the UK, um, which is similar in a lot of ways, though it operates through quite distinct mechanisms. Um, but one of the things that it shares is this idea or delusion or intentionally misinformed approach that you can kind of like eliminate gender transition as a process without doing any harm to the people who do or will experience that process um, or without affecting sort of their sense, their fullest sense of life. So more than kind of thinking that this isn't possible, although also that, um, my work and a lot of the work of the thinker activists I admire approach transition as a kind of given experience in life. Um, that our relationship to our bodies and our gender roles will change over time. And so, you know, to pretend that that's not true, actually, it's just like kind of removes a part of our experience as we've sort of been hearing today already and thinking about aging and um, menopause and, and all these different ways that that happens. Um, so yeah, so I just kind of often like to kind of flag this that often we think about, I think about transition as kind of like, one of the great transformative life processes like birth or grief or friendship. Um, and so the only way to like kind of learn more about it is to invest in it rather than to kind of like back away from it. So that's just kind of my, I start from this idea of just like moving forward from there rather than um, kind of debating some of the early, you know, I feel like often we're stuck debating the kind of base level questions. So I just kind of move forward. Okay. Um, so in the essay that I wrote and that I'm sort of thinking about, I considered a durational performance piece that transmasculine performance artist Casillas did from 2010 to 2013 in a couple of di different iterations um, called, yeah, called Teresius. And then it was kind of revived in 2018 um, in a group show. Um, so this is an image from the, the original um, in which uh, Casillas stands with their sort of torso against this ice sculpture of like Greeks, like sort of stereotypical Greek statuary, right? And so their body heat melts the statue over time. Um, but it's like also a kind of weird circuitous process because obviously like to keep your skin stuck to ice for a long time is like painful. It like produce, so there's this kind of uh, strange experience between the ice sculpture and the artist. Um, and also the ice, it's just kind of melting anyway, right? This, there's a way in which this is a, a performance that is not necessary. It's like not required to melt the statue, which as long as there's people in the room or whatever, unless it's like below freezing in the room, would melt anyway. Um, and then in 2018, um, it got revived as this piece called Solution, which uh, in which Casillas redid kind of their torso situation and also invited three other artists to do their own versions. And then they did this kind of like group touching of this ice cube. And so it was a way to think about expanding the, the project um, from just like the kind of mano a mano athletic vision of Casillas and the torso. Um, 
Yeah, so I had two big questions as I was thinking through this piece. On the one hand, um, what to do with affect, which seemed to promise the bringing of bodily knowledge into scholarship in a new way, but sort of instead became increasingly defined not only as amorphous, but wholly unpredictable and unpindownable, which seemed to me in a lot of cases to make it not super useful. Um, and then also I was interested in this question that was kind of all the rage in queer studies briefly about like non-medical body modification as a part of transition, um, which was maybe a well-intentioned way to kind of move away from a medicalized narrative, but was often extremely vague. And I was just like, okay, what is that? How do you change your body without kind of some biomedical, you know, at some level intervention? And so this piece kind of um, touched on both in thinking about uh, heat and in thinking about kind of the changing body next to the body. One of the critics who commented on this piece described Castile's torso behind the ice torso as like not too dissimilar from the ice torso. And so there's this weird sense of, um, you know, they're the same, but they're not the same. And at first you can see because he's you can see Castile's torso through the ice, but then you can see more of it. And so what, you know, what what exposure, what does this exposure offer you? Um, additionally, heat as something the body constantly produces, reacts to and adjusts for fit neatly with what I found to be the most lucid descriptions of affect, um, such as Deborah Gold's, who's my favorite. Uh, affect prepares the organism to respond to that which is impinging on it, though in unpredictable ways. And so we could think about um, the body responding to heat, right, in the, the kind of strange, uh, in the opening, um, we got that, Ellie gave us that thought about like adding heat to heat to sort of, you know, right, this question about how do you, that the way we respond to heat because of the way that the body mediates it is not always obvious, but it does kind of move us to respond in, in weird ways. Okay, so one of the things that at the end of that paper I became interested in was when the heat produced or received by the body matches up or not with the sensations that we associate with emotional feelings. One of the examples I used was of the bed warming with two people in it, and so that whether or not you touch could be um, based not on intimacy, but like on temperature, like you could want to cuddle if it's cold out and not if it's really hot out, and that could be get confused quite quickly with uh, a motive for intimacy. Um, another example I thought of recently is like when you're at a theater and you see a piece of art and you like get chills or whatever, or you're at the movies and you're like, ooh, but sometimes they just like have turned the air down. And so then you get these chills and you're like, am I, is it good? Am I like, where, what's the source of this feeling that I am, that's physical, but that I associate with an emotion? Um, in particular, I was interested in uh, in this new extension, how when we feel heat, what happens is that we experience a kind of change, right? If you and the heat that you're touching are the same temperature and you're both good at that temperature, you're not really registering that as, um, as a heat, right? When you touch something really hot and you feel that's hot, what's actually happening is that the you know thermodynamic energy in the thing that you touch is moving really quickly into you um, and speeding up the activity of like your little atoms, right? And so, uh, and so that's a change that you're experiencing. And so it's not like this static, like, oh, I feel the heat. To feel the heat is a is this transformation. Um, yeah, and, and because of that, it's relative, right? So in Ohio, in the US, there was recently this big chemical spill, um, which had vinyl chloride in it, which is used to make PVC, a plastic, um, and vinyl chloride boils, uh, at negative 13 degrees Celsius. So um, just one other example of this kind of relativity question around it. So in the poems I'm thinking about today um, by Jamie Fitzpatrick, uh, they come from her first book called Pricks in the Tapestry, which is in large scale kind of this recontextualization of, uh, of a certain kind of New York white gay culture in the US. Um, it's opening gambits are all, oh, I forgot to move it. This is the cover image by Paul Tech. Um, so it's opening gambits are all squarely in this New York gay world with this image, um, with these images throughout the book of a house in the Fire Island Pines, which is like a big summer New York City gay destination. Um, and then the book's title, Pricks in the Tapestry, comes from a poem in the book deeply indebted to John Giorno, um, who is also a poet, but famous for being in Andy Warhol's film Sleep, where he just filmed him, you know, he was like filming his lover while he was asleep. It's like very intimate and very beautiful. 
Um, and the title of the first book, which I'm going to talk about in a second, Scintilla Star, comes from British gay filmmaker Derek Jarman's 1986 Caravaggio, also Tilda Swinton's first film role. I didn't know that until I was writing this. Um, so Fitzpatrick's early poetic career was sort of like pre-transition, marked by the buoyancy of presumed white gay maleness um, and white cis desirability politics. And so the reception history of the book is it's kind of uh, it's kind of a weird one because people really pulled it into this gay history lens when actually so much of the book ended up being really about transition and about this progressive disaffiliation from gay community in a particular way. Um, and so in some ways it illustrates this trend, which is that even when there is overwhelming evidence presented of gender curiosity or transition, um, there's really an unwillingness by many, most people, by culture to point to that as, as that's what's happening um, because it's bad to be trans. And so it's bad to project it onto someone, air quotes, because obviously I don't think that, but, um, but that's kind of the weird pivot. And I got to tell you, there is probably nothing so frustrating as a sense over and over again that like the obvious gestures you are making that are screaming, there's something going on with my gender uh, being ignored, like that will really, um, it really reveals the actually deeply flexible sense of the stability of that binary and that they will, those categories of the gender binary will really expand in order to contain as long as possible um, gender indeterminacy. Okay, uh, so the first poem I wanna talk about uh, is called Scintilla Star. I use this kind of beige background because I read a thing recently that said, um, you know, like with piano music that like the best color to read text on is not white, but the kind of like a yellowish beige, which maybe is not true, um, but I'm interested in it. So I'm gonna read this poem um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the kind of role of temperature more specifically. Scintilla Star. In the old place, there was no place that did not see me. Wherever I went, mothers whispered about me like a Greek chorus. I heard that boy. I heard that. I was just a boy. But it was true what they said, that I liked other boys, that I had stolen Sarah's, though he was four years older and they were very much in love. I made him break up with her in a Chili's parking lot while I waited inside. I was 14. How humbling to have been 14, to have eaten at that Chili's often. That summer, I had no taste for anything but him, faintly of chlorine. When he left for college, I had no one. Sarah's friends stared me down at school. I found it was better if I could not be no one to be someone, small but particular specified, which was an apprenticeship for special, cold, another word for cool. So in this poem's title, Scintilla Star, it plays with the tension between names, between particularities, which might be related by scale or only by sound. It asks, is a scintilla a small star or something different? And then it tells a story about a teenage boy with a surprising power to steal an older heterosexual boy and take him as a lover, to make of a gay affair not a secret, but a public statement. One might think that, of course, the other boy was gay too, but the poem gives none of the tropes of gay high schools, the closet, sneaking to gay bars, whatever. Instead, it is more like the girls in the bathroom in Greece giving Rizzo the stink eye, um, it is the speaker put into a heterosexual drama where the other woman's possessive sexual magic is irresistible. Only the other woman is a boy. Um, as I hope is clear, I don't think that the speaker stays a boy. Nothing in this poem is in the present tense. It's all remembered with no explanation of what happens afterward. So did the speaker become special or particular? We don't know. I was just a boy is certainly a common phrase, but it is also one that establishes a temporal boundary around boyhood. Eventually something else happens. Why should a boy grow up to be a man? This poem seems to ask when boyhood and manhood have nothing to do with each other. Why should the boy not become distinct rather than part of a group? One answer might be that such distinction seems lonely. And in fact, one of the oddest and most interesting things about this poem is what I've been calling its cold light. It's summer for the bulk of the poem. And when at the end of the poem, it becomes fall, 
there is no change in the climate. The light of exposure, there is no place that did not see me, is not the sun. The speaker waits in the restaurant while the pivotal action happens outside in the heat. And as it ends, the poem makes a call to temperature that is also emotional and then immediately tweaks it. So to be cold is potentially to be physically cold, but also to be unemotional. To be cool is like almost the same thing, um, although the balance is slightly different. We might say that the first definition um, in kind of a descriptive sense of cold is of temperature and the second is of mood. And then in cool, the kind of first definition is mood and the second of temperature. So the temperature at the end of the poem in which the speaker is left alone gets converted, we might say thermodynamically, <laughs> into an emotion because it cannot be converted into heat. When you are alone, you might remember from the example of heat under the covers of the bed, uh, the total heat produced is lower than when you are together. You might feel it more with more people because there is more to feel. So the next poem I'm interested in is um, about halfway through the book and kind of also struggles with this question about loneliness and heat. So that poem is called The Pines, which is named after the Fire Island destination I mentioned, um, named in turn for the pines that grow there or used to, um, a tree that we might associate with a particularly rigid pattern of growth, um, at least imposed or in the aesthetic imagination, if you think about like, you know, the pines of Italy um, as one kind of visual. Um, uh, so summer again appears in this poem a bit more troubled than its previous experience. The heat of summer is closer, though still kind of not felt, just as the speaker is near a crowd, but not within it. So I'm going to read this one too, because it looks longer, but it's a little bit shorter. Whoever they were, I wasn't. At the pool party at seven, at 17, fat 27, I haven't gotten in yet, my borrowed swimsuit, legs dangling over the edge of what Matthew calls dick soup. It's his party, his suit, his housemates in the pool, their friends and lovers all glistening gold and pink. Like me, but wetter. Like me, but not somehow, as it has always been beginning in the family, even in the face of our shared face, even there, and at the school where no one was like me, and in the schoolyard where they made sure I knew it, the girls liked me, some of them, but I was stuck, a boy, distinct from them as from other boys, or I was the other boy, or I am the other still, watching from the blue periphery as they flex and pose for a photo I am not in. But what is the difference here in this village of men more or less like me? More definition, less poetry more muscle, less mess. A consciousness, they are so happy to be alike. That's all, that's it. So there's a lot to say about this poem, um, which shares some concerns about gender and visibility with the first poem, but is rooted really in a present instead, um, and really has this kind of struggle with futurity. There's this sense of it being the transformation it's interested in being blocked somehow, right? This speaker apart from, the other people in the poem. Um, one way to think about this, and we can talk about this more later, might be to think about the poems like almost simile, like it's the work of the poem is all comparison and all almost simile, um, but we don't really get like a proper simile, except for this question about like, is like me a simile? Which I bring up only because simile is the, maybe the figure of speech par excellence for showing the link of some comparison being made, right? Versus metaphor, which condenses stuff. Um, but it shows kind of how this disaffiliation, right? That the boys, am I like these boys, am I not? Also kind of has to take place in time. And it reminds us that when we have big feelings like affects, um, the way that affect prepares us to respond might be unpredictable, but then that response again has to find a specific form over time as we follow it. The poem also demonstrates, again, the trick of heat as both a felt material and emotional sensation in which we see the transformation of heat, which is it's the feeling of it, falter as it finds no effective or emotional match. Unlike the first poem, in the pines, we have a little bit more evidence of the warmth around the speaker. Um, it's summer, it's warm enough to be outside, people are in the pool but this heat is unregistered by the speaker. And so there's this in-group, out-group division um, 
that I think is interesting because the experience that dramatizes the separation is going into the water and then emerging from it glistening. That's an experience particularly designed to feel temperature differently. We get into the pool when it is warm enough to do so, and especially when it's warm enough that we will not freeze when we get out of the pool. Uh, sometimes we get in the pool specifically to cool down, um, you know, dunking your head in under the water, right? If it's really hot out, that kind of experience. Um, and so the glistening is the visual representation of a thermal exchange as the heat of the sun hits the water on the skin and they all kind of interact. Um, so when the speaker does not get in the water, they prevent this change from occurring. Um, they, they don't cool down to warm up, they just kind of stay put. So that feeling of change is deferred. Um, the other thing about this poem maybe that matches that is the couplets, right? That the couplets offer a kind of more literal constraint on this kind of movement. Um, any poem might be otherwise, but in this poem, like what might be otherwise like is not, is constrained by the couplets. Uh, and so then the last poem that I kind of, you know, is like, oh, well, we'll add this in too. Um, I'm not going to read this one because it's a lot longer, as you can see by the more crowded slide. Um, but in this poem, we this is the last poem of the book, Story of My Life. And there's this last pitch towards heat uh, and kind of this final gesture. Um, and so in the opening of the poem, two desires like twins I tend to, the one to be and the other to hold. The first looks like envy when the brunette in cowboy boots cycles past smoking a cigarette, her hair in a French braid. She isn't sweating like I am through my shirt for the third time today. Um, and then, so then at the end of the poem, there's this kind of, um, the, the poem then spends some time thinking about this woman and then another woman and then a boy on a skateboard. And at the end of the poem, they almost like intersect and they have this moment where they kind of reach each other. And since I mentioned couplets in the last poem, it's worth noting how this poem begins with this progression, um, one, two, three, two, one, right, monostitch monostic, uh, couplet, tercet, couplet, monostic, but then it kind of goes into its own way. Um, it says, oh, we could, now that we have found some ability to change, we like really can just change, right? We can work in whatever pattern we want to. Um, and the, stand, the uh, line lengths are also a bit longer, which goes along with that kind of like more formal reading. Um, but importantly, the introduction in the poem of distinct other people uh, who aren't just like a faceless group and aren't just like a referenced name, um, who reflect the self back to the speaker as they interact with each other, creates the sense of this poem's ability to try out, reflect, and transform. So we get these two desires. Um, one is sexual, one is gendered, and then they kind of mix as the poem goes on, right? Where the, the two people who represent those kind of interact with each other towards the end. But we also finally see the introduction of the speaker feeling some heat as she sweats three times through a shirt. Um, and so this reality demonstrates part of the difficulty of manifesting a desire as reality that is not only elegant, but bodily or ungainly. Um, it also highlights how the vision of the woman on the bike uh, in the beginning who does not seem to sweat is like really partial because we don't really know what she did before. We don't know how many shirts she sweat through before she got to this one. We don't know how long she's been on the bike. Um, so there's this strange sense of inventory taking of the world around it. This way that it generates the naming of desire, not as something isolated within the self, but connected to the world around the speaker, to the world of, of uneven and awkward connections um, of proximities. This poem in particular, which, you know, I'll leave up as, well, we won't leave it up because I'm about to be done talking, but um, but I encourage you to go find it um, there because there's this kind of real tenderness to it as it ends. Um, is desire without pain possible? Is desire possible without pain? Really, I want to know. I want to stop writing this poem. I want him to say yes and how graceful she is avoiding his orphaned board as it rolls her way. The poem seems is like asking this question that it knows the answer to in a way, right? Is desire without pain possible? Probably not. Um, but also in the kind of final indexing of 
being out in the social and sweating and watching these people interact with each other, there's also this kind of knowledge that like the elimination of desire, which has happened in the previous poems leading up to this point, is not without pain either. And so there's really going to be this, this difficulty either way, and you can kind of let it go to time, or you can like make this effort um, and make it more like towards your own desire. I had a slightly more elegant last sentence written on the paper that I riffed off of. Um, but that's the whole, that's the spiel. Um, thank you guys so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. I, I think I was really interested in your kind of description of the mutating trans body and gender indeterminacy, which I think ties in quite nicely with the kind of need for a multidirectional fluid perception of aging because I think we forget that aging you know aging begins as soon as we're born it's like an ongoing process but you always think of it as a kind of an, almost an I think what's come through today in very binarized terms but I think in French you have two terms for the same you know it's translated as aging you've got le vieillissement and la vieillesse and one is kind of a, a relative process and I think it's important that we we almost kind of bring attention back to that fluidity that, that um, you, you brought out so nicely.